Would you believe me that these entities looking like alien spaceships can give you common cold? Yes, that's because what we are looking at are viruses. In this two-part series, let's try to learn a little bit more about viruses so we know why they are unique. The first thing you would notice about a virus is that it's very, very small in size. So, what are we comparing it to? So, when we say very small, how small is the virus? Let's consider this as a virus and let's compare it to the schematic of a rod-shaped bacteria. Okay? Now, comparing both these to a eukaryotic human cell. I would give you a moment to figure out where the virus went. Have you figured it out yet? Yep, that's how small the virus looks compared to a eukaryotic cell. The bacteria is about 10 times smaller than the human cell. But the virus, on the other hand, is about 100 to 1000 times smaller than a human cell. The size of the virus was what intrigued the scientists who discovered them for the first time. In 1892, Ivanovsky was given the responsibility to figure out what was causing these wildfire infections in tobacco. They are called wildfire because the leaves turned yellow, a bright yellow. And when you look from afar, it seems as if the tobacco plantation was on fire. Now, by this time, people knew bacteria existed. So, the immediate thought was that it could be a bacteria, right? And there was the special filter that was used to isolate bacteria from different samples. So, he obtained the pulp of an infected plant and put it through the filter, expecting that he would be able to isolate bacteria. But to his surprise, he realized that he was working with something that was much smaller than a bacteria. So, he was the first one to say, viruses are smaller than bacteria. Bacteria. A few years later, in 1898, Bejernik also made a similar observation. He gave the term, contagium vivum fluidum. Contagium Vivum fluidum. The meaning is contagious infectious fluid. Now, why did he say that? So, till then, people believed that if you keep an infected plant next to a healthy plant, that is how the disease spreads. He was able to prove that that's not needed. So, he took the pulp extract of an infected plant and sprinkled it on a healthy plant and witnessed that the disease had spread to the healthy plant. And hence this term, contagious infectious fluid. So many years later, in 1935, Stanley was the one who was able to isolate viruses. Now, by this time, again in science, people were working extensively on proteins and they were able to isolate proteins as crystals. And we came to know that viruses also have proteins in their structure. So, he thought about it and realized he could isolate viruses as protein crystals. So, viral crystals were isolated by the scientist. The next interesting thing about virus is that it is biologically inert. When we say something is biologically inert, what do we actually mean? It means that the organism doesn't have any metabolism. Metabolism is the sum total of all the biochemical reactions that happen in our body. These are the reactions keeping us alive, doing all the basic functions in our body. And as an extension of no metabolism, there is no reproduction as well. So we can say that viruses are non-living. They are also acellular. When we look at a cell, whether it be prokaryotic or eukaryotic, we see specific cellular structures, right? So, they have a, a lipid bilayer, they have a nucleus and so on. But when you look at viruses, a lot of these structures are missing and hence we call them acellular. Given that they are acellular, what is present within a virus then? Well, it's quite simple. There is a genetic material which is covered by a protein coat 
called as the capsid. Capsid itself is made up of smaller units called capsomeres. Although this composition seems very simple, it has given rise to some very interesting shapes in viruses. One such shape is the helical shape. Uh, this is how a tobacco mosaic virus looks. The capsomeres here form the capsid and then we have the genetic material within it. Then comes the polyhedral shape, specifically uh, the icosahedral shape. So, this is what we saw earlier as an example and this is how they appear. This second image over here is the actual picture of a virus taken by a very um, a powerful microscope called as the transmission electron microscope. Adenoviruses have polyhedral shapes. Then comes the simple spherical uh, viruses. So, you have a spherical capsid within which the genetic material is protected. The influenza virus has a spherical shape. We also have shapes which we can't categorize into any of the shapes that we saw earlier. So, those we call as the complex shapes. This virus actually looks like a spaceship, doesn't it? This is a bacteriophage. Bacterio means bacteria, phage means eating. So, these are the viruses which can infect bacteria. The next feature is what genetic material. Next, we see the genetic material in viruses. Viruses can have RNA or DNA, but they never occur together in a single virus body. These could be single stranded or they could be double stranded as well. Among all the viruses that we have uh, discovered till now, the maximum are animal viruses. And animal viruses can have a single stranded RNA, double stranded RNA, or double stranded DNA. Next comes close behind as plant viruses, and we see only single stranded RNAs within them. Phage viruses have a double stranded DNA within them. 